Hello. If you missed this year's Comic Con International, you weren't alone. Celebrities and cosplay figures didn't invade San Diego over the weekend. The event was held online and fans weren't happy about it. However, the con still offered a sneak peek into some of the most anticipated movies and TV shows. Here's a look at a few. Comic Con at Home 2021 tried to be a traditional convention, albeit online. It featured exhibitions and panels. Actor Jodie Whittaker appeared to announce the return of Doctor Who season 13. Whittaker returns as the Doctor for more adventures in time and space, although those adventures have been limited to eight episodes that will tell a singular story. For a continuation on a story, there was Michael Hall. He appeared for the next installment of Dexter, which had a universally panned finale in 2013. I think enough time has passed and the storytelling opportunities were, were a lot more interesting, I think, for, for having had some time between the end and now. Sup, Jumbo? Dexter New Blood sees the serial killer far from his Miami home and seeking therapy, which is unlikely to do much good, just like this next character. Hi. I'm Chucky. Wanna play? Chucky gets his own highly anticipated TV series, but even a trailer of the show couldn't satisfy some fans of fantasy. Jake, are you okay? NPR pointed out this year's Comic Con had a few notable absences, mainly Marvel and DC. Gizmodo's Jill Pantozzi says without those two properties, this year's con has been a letdown. But while fans couldn't get any new information about superhero movies, such as Eternals and Aquaman in the Lost Kingdom, Army of Thieves tried to fill the gap. We've been watching you, and we want to recruit you. The movie is a prequel to Zack Snyder's Army of the Dead, and follows the story of Dieter, a German safecracker. He's recruited to lead a group of criminals in a top-secret heist. But this is no Ocean's Eleven. It's happening during the early stages of the zombie apocalypse. Nevertheless, no number of trailer premieres could turn around some fans' lackluster response to Comic-Con. Fuzzy Orange Bob says on Instagram, You had fewer panels and most were worse than last year. Get real, this is only survivable in person. And convention organizers heard the criticism. They say they're planning a smaller in-person event called Comic-Con Special Edition for late November. Let's talk to John Carlos Evans, a filmmaker and a staff writer at Black Nerd Problems. Hi there, good to have you with us today. So, hello, hello, hello. Theme parks are reopening, concerts are being staged, museums are open, but then we have Comic Con opting for the second time in a row uh, for, 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 for an online version of the event. Do you think it was a good idea? No, definitely. I feel like it's one of the largest events of gathering so many fans and creators, not only in the country, but across the world. But it's really the most responsible task path to take. There are hundreds of thousands of people at Comic-Con, and then that, you're not only exposing those people, but then the city itself. So it's, it's not the best situation, but it's, it's a compromise. And the public health is more important. And this is especially because uh, Comic Con is not only about you know events and you know seeing all the stars coming in, but more like communication within the community, right? Exactly. It's also it's like a it's a family reunion for a lot of people. If you're involved in this world of gaming, of speculative fiction, and of comics, and even that extending to films and television, then it's really the only time where people who are usually only connected via the internet. It's the only time you can see each other, you know, face to face, smell each other, see each other. Mm -hmm. And um, John, this year Marvel Studios and DC Films, they both uh, skipped the online convention. Do you think that it took away too much from the content? No, I just believe it shifts the focus more so. Like, as you mentioned, Disney has its own event, D23, that happens in the fall. And then DC as well, their film and their television franchises, that's all discussed at the DC fandom that's also in the fall. And so what they're doing now, more so for Comic-Con, is focusing more on their publishing content. And on the DC side, they're focusing more on their animated films, which are traditionally more critically received 
than their live action films. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was not so much film content and more of like TV uh, and comics this year, right? And gaming as well. Of yeah. Yeah, absolutely. This was primarily the focus, not only for the fact that streaming series is a much more, it's a bigger way to grab an audience and then keep them for hours and hours on end. So you're seeing a lot of Comic-Con, a lot of the panels lean towards this. So we had, there were specials on Tuki and Bertie, which was something that's going to be on Adult Swim, but originally it was on Netflix. Uh, the new Doctor Who season, there's a preview of this. So a lot of it really is focused more on the streaming content, more on series, more on like long-term content since we're all at home, most of us. Okay, well, all in all, um, uh, we've heard some fans, I mean, most fans and uh, honestly, some uh, critics as well. Uh, for example, Jill Pantozzi, we just heard in the package, calling this event as a letdown. Would you say that or do you think it's a bit of a bit of too much thing to say? No, I feel like it's more of an exaggeration. It's like any experience, any event, you get out of it what you put in. For me, I actually, I caught on a little bit late to Comic-Con this year, but I've still watched maybe 10, 15 panels. And some of those range from not only professional services such as writing or editing or doing inking for comics or cosplay, but then there are also things that are specifically for fan interaction. So it's up to, it's up to you. Whatever you want, it's there. Mm -hmm. Okay, tell us why you thought this year was exciting or what content you found the most exciting out of this Comic Con. Now, I'd say this year, the two most exciting things were probably the announcement of the, the Netflix animated series, which is an adapt adaptation of the Stan Sakai character and comic book, Usagi Ujumbo. Like most people know about this character because it was introduced in the Ninja Turtles cartoon in like the late 80s. But this character is actually one of the most awarded, most prestigious characters in comics history. And Stan Sakai as a creator, he's worked on it for 37 years. And so now it's getting a chance to find a new audience in kind of a CGI meets 2D animated series. But this one's more targeted towards younger fans because otherwise people who know Usagi Ujimbo are like my age. <laughs> okay, and also, well, Dexter is back. Are you excited for that? Exactly. I'm not huge into Dexter. I don't know the mythology of it so much. I've seen two episodes, but I'm curious to see it. I hear good things. Mm -hmm. And um, I heard you told my producer that you're excited for the new Blomkamp uh, movie as well for Netflix, the horror one. Yeah, exactly. Like this actually makes use of some interesting technology. It's kind of a mixed genre film. Like it's still very much sci-fi, which is what Blancol exceeds at, but it also has a weird kind of like nightmare and Elm Street kind of vibe mixed with some new technologies. So this one seems exciting. Okay, well, uh, we don't have much time left, John, but I really want to hear what you have to say about this. Um, in Wired, Angela Watercutter, a critic, says that um, Comic-Con pre-COVID grown um, unwieldy and expensive for fans and it was all about you know how star started it was and it was all you know glitz and glamour now after you know having online conventions for two years in a row it might actually go back to what it was before and be more about content and uh, and um, put the focus back on comics do you think that it is likely to happen and what do you see in the future of comic con uh, I feel like because we don't really have an end date of the pandemic in sight, a lot of events such as Comic-Con will probably go to more of a hybrid method where some content is available only online and some things will be done in person that may be in a limited capacity. In turn, it really depends on how far we're able to you know, get past this. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we'll have to wait and see, I guess. John Carlos yeah. Evans, it was lovely having you with us today. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. London's Royal Albert Hall celebrated opening night in front of a live audience. And the place was packed with celebrities and an expensive ventilation system. Nursen Atutar has more. Since the British government has lifted all COVID-19 restrictions, the show can go on at the Royal Albert Hall. But this is not just any opening night. 
It's a celebration of the venue's 150th anniversary. Hundreds of performers put on a concert called A Circle of Sound. They included celebrities such as Michael Sheen and Melanie C from the Spice Girls. The Royal Albert Hall still has COVID rules in place. Masks must be worn. And the venue's CEO says people should be aware of each other's distance. But social distancing is not required. Then there's the issue surrounding ventilation. So we've undertaken a massive ventilation program, about a million pounds are spent to make the air cleaner and fresher and all sorts, as well as cleaning regimes inside the hall itself. So all the public areas, all back of house, are being cleaned regularly with hospital grade viricide. So there's an awful lot being done beyond what the government says we should do to make sure the hall's a really safe place. The hall paid over a million dollars for the new system. That's despite being in debt and having to take out loans from the government's culture recovery fund. This is the worst situation we've been in for an awfully long time, but I'm confident now that we're back on our feet and performing again, we can trade our way out of our deficit. Though that confidence might have taken a hit at the box office. Even with all the pomp and pageantry, opening night didn't sell out. However, composer David Arnold says everyone was grateful to give a live performance. I think everyone was just a little bit damp in the eye department. It was, it, you, you're reminded about how special it is, not only because you're in this building, but the communal thing that happens when people play music together and the way that that actually directly lights up every part of your brain. It's the only thing in the world that does it. And in order for the Royal Albert Hall to continue on, it'll have to overcome an $80 million debt. Otherwise, what has been billed on a venue's 150th anniversary as a birthday concert may one day be its funeral march. To honor the Black Lives Matter movement, New York artist Tenda Francis took plywood used to board up storefronts across the city last year and turned it into a sculpture called Rocket Black. Hi, my name is Tanda Francis and this is my piece, Rocket Black. To transform this, this plywood that was on the streets during the Black Lives Matter uh, actual uprising is like, it's amazing. It's like a blessing to have that in my hands, like to have that to, as a material to work with because, you know, it, it actually lived life on the street like um, during that time and it had, I, I, it has the markings of it too to the point where I actually left a little bit of it here to remind us as, to remind the people who visit it like, where this plywood has come from. In my work, I actually use the color black and actually try to like elevate it, um, kind of contrast to how it's been sort of stigmatized in our culture. So um, I just, you know, show it in the most divine light. And here we go, like this is like what we have here, rocket black. I want to change the dialogue around the around the word black itself, and that you know, just show it as in its um in its glory. UNESCO has announced new additions to its World Heritage List. So far, more than a dozen sites have been chosen, including an avenue in Madrid, the great spa towns of Europe and an Indian temple. Also on the list is an archaeological site in eastern Turkey. It's called Arslan Tepemond, and it's been a religious and civil site for the past 8,000 years. The lineup for this year's Venice Film Festival has been announced. The competition will begin with the premiere of Pedro Almodovar's Madres Paralelas, starring Penelope Cruz. Alberto Barbera 
the event's artistic director, thanked Hollywood for its support. He noted that the quality of the films are higher than usual, as if the pandemic has stimulated creativity. Ai Weiwei unveiled a 32-meter-tall iron tree in Porto Seralbes Museum. He's trying to raise awareness surrounding the effects of deforestation. The sculpture is made from a real-life mold of an endangered tropical tree found in the Brazilian forests. To emphasize the environmental threats that our planet is facing, the tree is leafless, hollow and rusted. The art collection, owned by Samsung founder Lee Kun Hee, is on display in Seoul. Lee's family donated thousands of artworks to the National Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art following his death. This exhibition features 58 pieces by modern Korean artists. The South Korean government intends to open a museum to house Lee's entire collection. And Netflix has announced it will be adding free mobile video games to its platform. The company is looking for ways to address slower subscriber growth, stemming from an increased number of streaming sites and a relaxation of COVID-19 lockdowns. Netflix says its gaming venture will be a multi-year project that will start small with games based on Netflix hits. Nadim Naman and Dana Alfredan spent their time on the lockdown jetting between Doha, Dubai and the UK. They did so to record songs inspired by the poetry of Rumi. And here's what they came up with. I will be with you. Poetry forms the backbone of the lyrics in the show and it's, it's a real privilege to take his poems and try and reshape them into songs. It's not always the easiest thing to do because Rumi as a poet didn't necessarily rhyme and of course we're working on numerous translations of his work, some of which are very old, some of which are more, more modern. So we have to try and take the images and phrases and key words that we connect with the most and then use them as the building blocks for a song. At the moment it, it exists as an album and we're very grateful that we've had the opportunity to do that whilst in a lockdown environment. But ultimately, yeah, we, we want to get him on stage. We're working very hard to make that happen. Hopefully there'll be some news very soon about the beginning of that journey. The next installment in the Power franchise hits television screens this week. And the spin-off is a coming-of-age prequel story for character Conan Stark. A little piece of me in each one of the shows. But you don't want to hear me, though. Come on, man. This is my story. This is the South Side Jamaica Queen story. Don't call it a comeback. I've been here for years. Every time I make you call the cops. You still in training. Time to put them reps in. Let's do this. There definitely was a, a bit of like a, a nerve setting in. It was like, you know, one, this is such an iconic character with such big shoes to fill. You know, this is such a prominent figure in this in this franchise. So, you know, there was definitely the there was one, the the pressure of that. Then there was two, the, you know, the honor and the kind of, you know, the the feel good of like, oh wow, they they've entrusted me to take this baton and run with it. for me in, in Raising Canaan was to get back to the 90s, to get into that time period. And the change of it, like it's, it's almost an anchor, the, the, the music that matches the, the tones of the actual show that's from the 90s era, the uh, 
the, the fashion, the clothes, the the hairstyles, the energy that the, the whole project just it just takes me to a different place because of where I was like in that at that time in my life. A city in Spain staged an open-air concert, but COVID-19 wasn't a huge concern. That's because audience members were surrounded by protective bubbles. Four-legged stars ruled the red carpet at a Czech film premiere. The movie is about rescued dogs and it's helped finance a new shelter for the actor's fellow canines. During my work for the dog rescue organization, I was very emotional. I heard a lot of stories about dog rescue operations. And one day, I decided to start writing them all up. This whole project's aim was to raise awareness for a lot of things and to make money for shelters and organizations in need. That is what we wanted. Street artists in Morocco have joined forces for a new exhibition, but to participate, they had to ditch the streets and head indoors. Street artist Ed Onad creates most of his murals outdoors. But he recently painted the walls of a staircase for an exhibition called Street Art Inside. And he got help from three other artists. Together they transformed the space that's home to the Hiba Foundation. It's a non-profit that develops artists. The objective of this exhibition is to define street art. This art is normally outside and we are trying to bring it inside. That's why we named it Street Art Inside. These artists were more comfortable because they don't have the problem of going to seek authorization. Ayub Fetili and Mehdi Zemouri also worked on the walls of the staircase. Zemouri normally works on his own, so it took him a while to adapt to this new workflow. The idea of working together was a bit difficult, but we found common points between us, which ultimately allowed us to produce appropriate work as a group and also create a bond between our works, especially regarding colors. Here, Reda Budina's geometric patterns can be seen side by side with Vatili's graffiti. But Vatili says working indoors lacks a certain freedom. The difference between working on an exterior wall and an interior wall is the fact that working on an exterior wall can mean having a large area and more freedom. On the other hand, inside we're a little tight and we work more on the quality. The artists also got to teach the basics of street art and this part of the exhibition displays the works made by those who attended the workshops. 
we uh, have the pleasure to, to receive uh, uh, a lot of people interested in street art and they were uh, surprised and satisfied of this uh, experience. Uh, we had uh, the opportunity to offer uh, workshops and uh, workshops to discover the basics of street art, uh, materials, uh, colors and new concepts. But this exhibition will soon be over and the artists have already gone on their separate ways. Such projects come and go, but street artists always head back home, to the streets where they belong. That's it on this episode of Showcase. Our YouTube channel, Instagram and Twitter accounts have more from the world of culture and the arts. I'm Elif Bereketli, thanks for watching, bye for now.